The last great Pokemon generation was Gen 5. That was the last time I fully completed a Pokemon game and left excited for the future of the series. X and Y focused so much on transitioning into 3D that they forgot to make content. Sun and Moon embraced the JRPG side by being more of a movie than a game. And Sword and Shield were so violently mediocre, it convinced Nintendo fans that maybe the highest grossing media franchise of all time should put some effort into their products. Continuing on that trend, Scarlet and Violet are absolutely the bare minimum. Let's get the obvious one out of the way. The game looks terrible, and that's not a debatable topic. I don't care about graphics and games, but there is a level of immersion that is lost when the textures look like N64 Choco Mountain. If Mario Galaxy can look this good 15 years ago, I think I should expect at least a quarter as much from a AAA game on the Switch. The only thing worse than the graphics is somehow the performance. Throughout my playthrough, there were more frame drops than a clumsy mover with hand tremors at the Museum of Modern Art. Many times it felt like I was just watching a slideshow. I wanted to buy some clothes, but uh-oh, the model doesn't load until you get frustrated and leave. One time the game froze on me for so long, I thought I had activated a cutscene. Which brings me to another problem. The glitches. You can look at Twitter to see the clips people have been compiling. And what's even wilder is that new glitches get discovered every single day. Fun fact, there is a bug where each online battle starts with the same RNG seed. That means that some moves are guaranteed to hit or miss. The one-hit KO move, Sheer Cold, always hits turn one, effectively destroying competitive VGC for the time being. Never have I seen a Pokemon game release in such an unfinished and buggy state. To be fair, I wasn't alive when Gen 1 came out, but that's besides the point. You know, Gen 9 has a hint of Gen 1's Pokemon design philosophy. As in, there are Pokemon that are literally just animals. That is just a flamingo. That is just four mice with more parents than the average Pokemon fan. The number of designs that look ridiculous increases. Crocolore is Fuecoco with a funny hat. You grab 999 coins just for Gimigol to look like he wants to sell you string cheese. The Dunsparce is really funny the first time you see it, and sad on every other look. Not to mention, my least favorite starter I've ever seen evolve. When I became an ally of the LGBTQ community, I did not realize that meant we were allies of combat. Quaquavel is just a grown gay man. All of this is to say that Scarlet and Violet are riddled with flaws. They needed at least another six months to a year in development to come out as a completely polished product. That being said, I've been having a blast playing Scarlet. It feels like the characters actually have charm again? Gym leader-wise, I love that Larry treats battling like a job in a world where people think dogfighting is something everyone should be passionate about. And like a real content creator, Iono doesn't actually care about her fans, just about her views. I'm different though, I promise. I actually care about you guys, definitely. Pokemon has finally experimented with giving flaws to the good characters this generation. I especially like Grusha, whose whole thing is that he's very cold, and almost mean because he sees his younger self in you and is afraid your dreams will also come to an unfortunate end. Arvin joins N and Lily as mainline Pokemon characters who have good story arcs. Seems like having terrible parents is the best way to be interesting. The Titan storyline actually made me feel emotions, which is more than I can say for most Pokemon generations. A lot of the time trainers will say they love their partner, but when you see Arvin physically fall to the floor in joy, you actually understand how his Mabostiff is his best friend in the world. The endgame strengthens his character even more. The whole game, Arvin is infuriated at his mom thinking she abandoned him, when in reality, she was already dead. And it's not like this twist comes out of nowhere. 
From the beginning of the game, the professor gives very robotic responses to the player, which I thought was just classic Pokemon dialogue. I was tricked by the series' notoriously horrible writing into falling for one of the best twists since taking the Ferris wheel in Nimbasa City. Sada and Turo work fantastically as villains. In a game all about finding your treasure, they offered the perspective of people whose treasure comes at the expense of others, directly challenging the beliefs of the main character's party whose goals mostly work out in the end. I loved how they were so far gone that even the AIs they created were terrified of how dedicated they were to finding their treasure. Now, I know I dunked on the Pokemon designs earlier, but gameplay-wise, this might be my favorite batch so far. Every monster you catch feels like it has its own unique gimmick. Tinkaton is a nuke with a 160 base power Gigaton Hammer. Keep in mind, with Stab, it goes up to 240 base power, and with a Terra Boost, it clears 300. Tatsurugi jumps into Dondozo's mouth with one of the most unique mechanics in the entire series. Mousehold gets the terrifying Population Bomb, which hits up to 10 times, applies effects like King's Rock, and gets boosted by Technician, which these stupid mice get. We got our first Grass Fire, Poison Normal, Electric Fighting, Poison Steel, Bug Dark, and Ground Fighting types. Every addition to your team feels powerful and worthwhile, each in their own special way. Compare this to past generations where like, what does Cryogonal do for you? The Paradox Pokemon once again proved that regional forms were the best idea to come out of Gen 7 besides Professor Kukui's hot abs. I like how they're named as if they were found in real life. But all of this other stuff is icing on the cake. What truly encapsulated me was the gameplay. When I was a kid still waking up every 8am to catch the black and white anime, this was the game I had always imagined. Riding my Koridon chasing after hordes of Tauros, traveling to seemingly useless islands to snag a TM. Stumbling into areas I was way too underleveled for, each time I expected some form of handholding to stop me from doing what I wanted, it never came. Even during the very, very short opening, you can just walk off the path and go catch flamigos. I would bounce around the map from objective to objective, barely fighting any trainers or wild encounters. Walking into gyms 5 or even 10 levels under turned the usual one button super effective spam fest into intricate puzzles where my entire team needed to pull their weight. I didn't even get to talk about the really cute Team Star plotline or the ruined Pokemon or even my own team, but I'll leave you with this. Yes, it feels rushed. Some of these designs are terrible. It performs worse than me in bed, and no AAA game should ever release like this. But goddammit, these games feel alive. After over 12 years of putting out soulless fodder titles to feed my nostalgia, I finally feel some warmth and charm coming from the dead eyes of this series. Scarlet and Violet make me just as excited for Pokemon as I was when I caught Zekrom when I was 6 years old. And I think that's something special.